Hello and welcome back to Bookish. Today I'm interrupting my normal Bookish program programming for another politically related rant. I posted on my on my community feature on my channel whether or not people wanted to hear a rant about gun control and the Second Amendment. Uh, I got about 90 votes so far and about 87% of them said yes. So that's one of my motivations for doing this. Another motivation is that when I get really frustrated and angry, about a social issue in the United States, political issue in the United States, have a tendency to rant one way or another. And then my third reason for going ahead and, and, and filming this and putting this video up today is that I just learned this morning uh, that the uh, man who shot and killed 10 people in Boulder, Colorado purchased uh, the assault rifle, or the assault weapon he used to kill those people on, uh, purchased it last week and they does in fact have a criminal record, which means if we'd had adequate background checks, uh, uh, he would have uh, probably been denied that weapon and those 10 people uh, might still be alive today. Uh, and that kind of pushed me over the edge. So I wanna to talk today specifically about the Second Amendment, what it does and doesn't mean, in my opinion, uh, and then about uh, kind of how I think we should approach uh, gun control. Uh, regulation in the United States. So let me start off by saying that I am a gun owner. I come from a family of gun owners. Most of us own guns. What I'm going to say, and it's not going to sound bad, we, we own guns almost inadvertently through the process of inheritance. Uh, we've uh, come into possession of guns. There are some active gun owners in my family. Uh, not very many, but I can't think of a single household from my family, with the exception possibly of my daughters, in which there is not uh, a gun. Um, so I want to put that out there. Also, as a reminder, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I do have an advanced degree in American history. Uh, but uh, just to make, make clear what, what I'm talking about. So let me just talk about the Second Amendment first. The Second Amendment essentially says that a well-regulated militia being necessary for the preservation of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In other words, that because when the Second Amendment was written back in 17. Uh, 89, uh, because we needed militias to preserve or protect us from foreign invasion and from <clears throat> Native Americans, and by the way, uh, they thought also from slave rebellions, uh, <clears throat> that we as citizens have the right uh, to own weapons, to keep and bear arms. I will say that even though I think it's unfortunate and even though I would support a constitutional amendment uh, changing the meaning, the intent, the scope of the Second Amendment. What I will say is I believe the Second Amendment does give American citizens the right to own guns. I don't think there's any doubt about it. The Supreme Court has been consistent in interpreting that way, whether or not we belong to a militia. But the Second Amendment also clearly indicates that there is a regulatory function in this, that the militia has to be well regulated. So if we just as private citizens who own guns constitute a militia, then it would seem to me the government obviously has the power to regulate uh, gun ownership in the United States. And again, the Supreme Court has consistently upheld this right as long as the United States government approaches regulation of guns in a very specific way. So I'll just explain this as quickly as I can and based on my understanding. When governments pass laws outlawing ownership of guns, the Supreme Court rules those laws unconstitutional because in their minds they directly uh, countermand or infringe on Second Amendment rights to own guns. When the United States government passes laws which outlaw the importation, the manufacture, the distribution, and sale of certain classes of guns in the United States, then the courts uphold those powers. So this just has to do with the idea of, you know, our rights versus the power of government to make law and enforce laws that promote and protect public health and safety. Those are rights or powers in conflict. So while I believe that everyone in the United States has the right to own guns under the Second Amendment, whether or not I think that should be true or not is not the issue. The Second Amendment says that you do. Even though that's true, I believe the government has the power under its commerce power to regulate the availability of certain types of weapons and certain types of guns. And then when we approach it this way, whether it's the National Firearms Act of the 1930s, its update in the 1970s, the assault weapons ban, which was in place from 1994 and the Bush administration allowed to uh, expire in 2004, that those laws against 
importation, manufacture, sale, distribution, that those laws work and are upheld as constitutional because it is seen as a legitimate power of government to protect or promote public safety, which overrides perhaps the uh, right of citizens to own any weapon they want. As a matter of fact, the Supreme Court has never ruled that American citizens, uh, that the Second Amendment gives the American citizens the right to own any gun that they want. Even most recently, Justice Alito said that the, there's nothing in the Second Amendment that says that American citizens have the right to own any gun that they want. So this then creates our gun problem. Uh, we have a tradition of gun ownership in the United States, as I mentioned with my family and lots of other people, and lots of people in the United States are, are gun enthusiasts and own lots of guns. There are more guns in the United States than there are people. Uh, and uh, that's counted for by the fact that people who own guns have a tendency to own more than one. Uh, and some people own, you know, literally dozens of guns. That's not uh, that uh, unusual for people to own multiple guns in the United States of America. So we do have then a gun problem related back to the Second Amendment. And our issue, I think, in the United States is to figure out how to live with that and how to promote and protect public safety. And it is clear that the mass shootings that have been taking place uh, in the United States of America <clears throat> over the last 20 plus years are an indication the government is not doing its job. When the assault weapons ban that was passed by the Clinton administration was in effect, there were in a sense very few mass shootings. As soon as that assault weapons ban expired, mass shootings begin to, begin, to, begin to go up so much so that they're so common now that we can barely talk about one before the next one happens. As a matter of fact, my, my fear is, not for the video, but for, but for people is, that before you watch this video, there will have been another mass shooting uh, in the United States. We had one in Atlanta last week. We had one in, uh, in Colorado this week. Um, so there's clearly a mass shooting problem. And one approach I think that works to kind of this problem of mass shootings and what we do about the United States are, are some obvious things like <clears throat> registration, universal background checks, so that we can have a gun owner database where we connect to our criminal activity database and we can deny certain people guns like the, you know, Colorado shooter from yesterday. The, the, the truth of the matter is that guns are so easily available in the United States that most mass shooters acquire their guns legally. A lot of people uh, who are gun owners and promoters of gun ownership like to say the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Well, that good guy that with a gun that stops a mass shooter is usually a policeman uh, and not a private citizen. And they seem to believe that if we had fewer guns, that would make mass shootings a bigger problem. In effect, what they're saying is, because people have these guns, more of us need to have these guns so we can stop people who have guns. Now just think about how illogical that is. There are occasions in the United States in which uh, private citizens with guns have stopped criminals and mass shootings, but they are far more rare uh, than the fact of regular gun violence in the United States and regular uh, shootings. So I don't think there's any doubt that just basic common sense things like universal background checks and gun registration systems like we have for cars and all kinds of things would help us get a, get a handle on our gun violence pro problem. But I also think that we need to go back to attacking the problem of the availability, availability of certain types of weapons in the United States through the government using its commerce power as it has in the past and as the Supreme Court has consistently uh, upheld. That there are classes of weapons that we should move to outlaw the sale, manufacture, distribution, importation of. And the number one weapon of uh, choice of mass shooters today, the one weapon we see most commonly used, as a matter of fact, in the worst mass shooting in American history, the one in Las Vegas, the only type of weapon which could have possibly carried out uh, that shooting and killed 50, or more than 50 people and wounded more than 100 people is the AR-15 type weapon or an assault weapon or assault rifle. I'm calling it an AR-15 type weapon because one of the things that is commonly used by pro-gun people on uh, social media to kind of silence or humiliate or to intimidate uh, people who speak out for gun ownership, for, for gun control laws, 
is they make fun of non-gun people, people they mention to be non-gun people, for not knowing some basic things. So AR-15, the AR does not stand for Assault Rifle 15. That's not what it stands for. AR stands for Armalite Rifle, model number 15. <clears throat> the AR-15 was the model upon which the M16, the primary rifle of the United States military that has been in use since Vietnam, was based. Okay, It is uh, a very specific type of, of, a, of an assault weapon. So AR stands for Armalite Rifle 15, and some people like to be nitpicky about that. I noticed that uh, you know, <clears throat> genius Congressman uh, Lauren Boebert said, I bet it just posted on Twitter last week, you know, making fun of people who assume the AR stands for assault rifle. Either way, these are assault weapons and they, they have something in common. So the AR-15 type rifle here in the United States is a semi-automatic rifle. In other words, you can shoot as fast as you can pull the trigger that the mechanism of the weapon allows you to fire as quickly as you can pull the trigger which means you can fire a lot of shots. But it's not just the amount of bullets that you can fire from the AR-15, which makes it the choice of mass shooters and makes it so deadly. It's, it's the, the physics of that weapon. So the reason, one reason why the United States military adopted the AR-15 platform for the M16 was it combined several things that were useful. A, the M16 is lighter than the old M1 or the other M uh, type rifles that the military was using. There's a lot of plastic in the construction. Two, the caliber, caliber of the bullets is smaller. The M16 fires a 5.56 bullet. The AR-15 type rifles fire a .223. Now essentially those rounds are the same. There are some differences, but essentially those rounds are the same and they're light. They're not heavy. This allows soldiers uh, to carry lots of ammunition on their body at a low, at a low uh, weight cost. So it's not overly heavy. And then in addition to that, one of the things that the designer of the AR-15, the actual Armor Light Rifle 15, understood had to do with the ballistics and wound ballistics specifically. And this is what makes the AR-15 style rifles so deadly. So they fire a relatively small caliber bullet. There is a, a has for a long time in the United States and around the world been the assumption that the bigger the bullet is, the more deadly it is. This is not necessarily true when you take into account wound ballistics. The .223, which is the round that the <clears throat> AR-15 style weapon fires, is a small projectile, but what makes it so deadly is that it travels at an enormous speed. So to look at the two most common or two of the most popular then uh, rounds of ammunition fired from guns in the United States that people buy for home defense, you have nine millimeter, which is usually a handgun, even though I believe it can be found in a carbine style rifle. You have a nine millimeter and you have the AR-15 type. A 9mm bullet is about twice as big as the .223 that the AR-15 fires. It's about twice as big, but it travels at about one-third the speed. So what the designer of the AR-15 realized is that a small projectile traveling at an enormous speed actually does more damage and causes more ghastly wounds than a larger projectile traveling at a slower speed. And to give you some indication, a 9mm round travels at about <clears throat> 1,200 to 1,500 feet uh, per second. A 2.223 fired from an AR-15 travels at about 3,000 feet per, per second. Right out of the barrel, it's over 3,000 feet. 100 yards away, it's still around 2,800 feet per second. That means that little bullet is moving incredibly quickly. And when it hits something, because it's lighter, it immediately becomes less stable. Then when it becomes less stable, it's going to do more damage to tissue. I'll link an article from The Atlantic in which an ER doctor, or radiologist, talks about this, this process. But that small bullet actually does more damage because of wound ballistics. Okay? It just does more damage. It's less likely to travel straight. It's less likely to go straight through uh, tissue. It's more likely to tumble, to break apart, to cause multiple wounds. And in addition to that, because it is transferring so much more energy, 3,000 feet per, 
per second versus 12, 1300 feet per second. It's transferring so much more energy, it actually causes the tissue around where the wound takes place to expand and, and, and contract relatively quickly. This causes laceration, blood loss, internal damage to organs, even if those organs weren't actually hit. This is what makes the AR-15 so deadly. And there is no reason why, constitutionally, the United States government cannot ban importation, manufacture, distribution, and sale of AR-15 style rifles. We could do that. We could base those bans on muzzle velocity and semi-automatic status and magazine capacity and barrel length, and we could get rid of these guns, future sales of these guns. One reason why I think this needs to happen really quickly is that the AR-15 type rifle is the most popular gun being purchased in the United States of America today, and we are selling something like 3 million of these things a year in the United States. And the longer we wait, the more of these will, there will be in circulation. And I think there is a, a definite connection between the popularity of the AR-15 style rifle and the increase in mass shootings and the deadliness of those mass shootings. This is a public health concern. It falls well within Congress's power to do something about this. But notice I'm being very specific and that's because I, no matter what I might want to see happen in terms of gun control and in terms of getting rid of the Second Amendment, we're unlikely to get rid of the Second Amendment. And the United States government is never going to be authorized to step in and seize people's guns, to literally confiscate guns. You know, uh, politicians have floated the idea of mandatory buybacks and things like that. I'm just not sure those things would be constitutional. But what is constitutional is to move to ban future sales, to make, to prevent these guns from continuing to be available to pass laws you know, forbidding the resale of those guns from people who own them to others, and then to forbid, the, as I've been saying, the importation, manufacture, distribution, and sale of those weapons to the United States, that's well within the government's power. And since it is a public health emergency, that's what I think we should do. So I have a lot of opinions about gun control issues. Number one, background checks, yes. Registration, Yes, these things need to happen. These are dangerous products in the hands of citizens, and we need to regulate how that happens. People with criminal records, people with restraining orders, people with a history of domestic violence should not be allowed to go into a gun store or into a, you know, a sporting goods store and buy a gun. They, they just shouldn't. That is a recipe for disaster. Okay? They have given up their right to gun ownership because of their criminal activity. Okay, we, lots of states ban people who are felons from voting even after they get out of prison, but we'll let them buy a gun. This doesn't make any sense. So this is just common sense stuff, and it does not interfere with your Second Amendment rights to keep and bear arms. Notice the Constitution, the Second Amendment says keep and bear. In other words, own. So none of those affects your right to own a gun, unless, of course, you should be prevented from owning a gun because of criminal background, nor does a ban on manufacture, distribution, sale, importation of certain types of weapons into the United States violate that right either because, as the courts have said consistently, you don't have the right to own any gun you want to. The Second Amendment does not extend that right to you. So what I think we should do is we should start with the, what should be the easiest weapon to put, in play, put this ban in place for, and that's the AR-15 style uh, rifle uh, or the assault style rifle. And I know this works and I know we can do this because we've done it. We had 10 years of this exact gun control which was upheld by the United States Supreme Court and it limited, it reduced the number uh, of mass shootings that took place in the United States. We could do this. This is a law that could be created. These are laws that have been created and they don't violate the Constitution. What I don't think helps the issue of gun control in the United States is for gun control people to talk about confiscating guns, to talk about banning gun ownership, because then you do approach that Second Amendment barrier, which, like it or not, is a reality. It does really exist. You cannot just ignore that amendment and start taking away guns or start telling people they can't own certain guns that they already own because then I think you're in trouble with the Constitution and I think when we call for that, when you see people call for banning gun sales or confiscation of guns or anything that sounds like that, you make gun owners 
more conservative, and they don't want to allow any kind of gun uh, control legislation to pass, and they don't want anything done to regulate gun ownership. When in reality, the majority of gun owners in the United States today support registration, support background checks. You know, they support those those things, and we could get those things done. But I don't think we can get uh, the majority of American people on board, particularly not gun owners in the United States, on board if we don't approach it through constitutional means, which I do think is is definitely uh, a possibility. By the way, I said I would link an article below from The Atlantic which talks about the difference in the wounds caused by a 223 or an assault, an AR-15 style weapon round, the wounds caused by it versus a 9mm. Uh, I will do that. I'm not going to link uh, videos that you can find on YouTube readily available uh, that show the impact of the uh, .223 round in ballistics gel, but they are everywhere. If you want to see, you know, <clears throat> what these rounds do when they hit ballistics gel, ballistics gel, by the way, is an analog for human tissue. Uh, it's a gelatin type stuff. They make it in blocks and they fire guns into it to see, you know, to get some idea of what kind of damage that bullet would do to the human body. If you want to look at those videos, you can just do in, in, do a YouTube search for .223 ballistic gel and you could find them and by the way <clears throat> even if you if you find this whole thing distasteful I do think it's valuable to go look at those videos because when you look at those videos you will hear gun the gun people these are people who love guns and they love the AR-15 style rifle uh, at their most honest because they believe they're talking to other gun people and when they fire these bullets into ballistics gel and they look at it, they will ooh and ah over the uh, wound cavity that's been created. They'll cut them open and show how much in damage has been done. Uh, they will, you know, they will talk about how, you know, this is a good thing because it allows you to, you know, stop people who are trying to hurt you, etc. Because it's an effective weapon at doing that. Uh, and that, that is when they're at the most honest. A lot of times gun people are at their most dishonest when they're talking to non-gun people because they try to uh, overawe non-gun people with uh, what sounds like really technical stuff and practical stuff like, for instance, they'll take uh, the 223 round and they'll show you how small it is and they'll fire it into a paper target. And when you see the 223 hole that makes it a paper target, it's, it's small. It's, you know, I don't know, it's smaller than than the end of a, or, or it's smaller than the, than, the, than the size of a pen or a pencil. It's small because the entry hole is small. It's what the bullet does on the inside that matters. And they'll try to make it seem like that's not a big deal. They'll, they'll compare the .223 to the .22, the .22 long rifle uh, bullet. And they'll say, look, they're the same size and nobody would use a, a .22 to try to do a mass shooting. Therefore, the assault uh, rifle or the AR-15 style rifle isn't that deadly. It's being overblown by the media. What they fail to point out is that a .22 long rifle's muzzle velocity is about 1,200 feet uh, per second. And the AR-15 style muzzle velocity for the .223 is about 33,000 feet per, per second. And that is that then it means that bullet hits you with a lot more energy and it does a lot more damage. You know, there are a lot of gun gun people who try to who try to overall a uh, non-gun people with this kind of knowledge. But if you go and watch their videos, they're honest with each other about what they're talking about. The other thing I will tell you about the AR-15 is that it only exists for one reason. Uh, it exists to kill people. That's what it is. A lot of people say, oh, it's not a weapon of war because it's not fully automatic like the M16. That's one of the only significant differences uh, that exists. It is a weapon of war. It exists and was created for one purpose, and that was to kill people as efficiently and quickly as possible. Can you use an AR-15 style rifle, rifle for hunting? You can. Uh, but you probably can find uh, better, more accurate hunting rifles if what you're really interested in doing is killing animals efficiently. I've heard the argument, particularly here in Texas, that you needed to fight off wild hogs. We do have a real wild hog problem. It's not a joke uh, here in Texas. And wild hogs are big, and the boars do have incredibly sharp tusks, and they, are, they do have a nasty disposition. Uh, but there are other uh, hunting rifles that can be used to kill 
uh, wild boar. But, you know, it's not really used for anything other than killing people. And I think the proof of that is that the weapon our military choose, carries, our soldiers carry in combat, is essentially the same style of weapon. And obviously the military uses those weapons for one purpose, and that is to, to kill people. By the way, if you're thinking, oh, well, but, you know, target shooting, that's what you use. An AR-15 style weapon is an incredibly expensive target shooting toy. AR-15 rounds cost anywhere between about 60 cents to a dollar a piece. So a box of 100 AR-15 uh, shells is gonna run you about somewhere between 60 and 100 dollars. And when you think about the fact that you can load a magazine with 20 plus rounds into that thing and you can fire those 20 rounds as fast as you can pull the trigger, you're gonna chew up 100 dollars really quickly. Uh, so if target shooting is what you want to do, the AR-15 is, is a bad choice. By the way, AR-15 bullets also come with hollow points, which are designed to create a bigger wound. They come with ballistic points, which essentially means the bullet disintegrates uh, when it hits things, causing even bigger wounds. And, but just the regular full metal jacketed uh, AR-15 bullet does a tremendous amount of damage. So my, what I would like to see us do is move to ban assault rifles again more specifically and even more effectively than we did in, in uh, 1994, but not ban ownership. That genie's out of the bottle. Ban future sales, manufacture, distribution, importation. That's the way to approach it um, while accepting because that, ex that takes into account the reality that the Second Amendment does guarantee American citizens the right to own guns, whether I like it or not. Anyway, I kind of got uh, off track there at the end because there's a lot of stuff I wanted to tell you specifically about the AR-15. But there you go. There's my rant uh, about guns. Uh, we should definitely support universal background checks, registration, and uh, ban on future sales, distribution, manufacture, importation of AR-15 style rifles. And I think the United States would be a better, safer place if we did. Anyway, there you go. There's my rant for this week. Thanks for watching.